You are listening to episode 39 of the EU Startups Podcast. Today's guest is Rodolphe Adand, the founder and CEO of the spend management platform and French unicorn Spendesk. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the EU Startups Podcast. And before we jump into the interview with today's guest, I'm excited to introduce our podcast sponsor. This episode of the EU Startups Podcast is brought to you by Vanta, helping you scale security practices and automate compliance for the industry's most sought-after standards. To close and grow major customers, you have to demonstrate trust. But providing your security and compliance can be time-consuming tedious and expensive, especially for startups, unless you use Vanta. Vanta automates up to 90% of the work for the most thought-after compliance standards like SOC2 and ISO 27001 and gets you audit-ready in weeks instead of months. With Vanta, you get up to 400 hours of your time back and reach up to 85% in cost savings. And for a limited time, EU Startups listeners get $1,000 off Vanta. Just go to vanta.com forward slash EU Startups without a dash to get started. Today I'm excited to interview Rodolphe Adarnt, the co-founder and CEO of Spendesk, the all-in-one spend management platform helping businesses spend smarter. Founded in 2016 and headquartered in Paris, Spendesk's spend management solution today is trusted by thousands of businesses from startups to some of the world's biggest brands. Rodolphe, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the EU Startups podcast. Thank you, Thomas. Super happy to be here. Awesome. So I would say let's start at the very beginning, even before Spendesk. Uh, I saw that you had some entrepreneurial projects before this uh, big successful company. So when did you discover your entrepreneur entrepreneurial bug and what were your, the first companies that you uh, helped create? Uh, thank you for the question. And maybe I can I can start by introducing myself Um uh, so I, I, I graduated as an engineer, you know, in France uh, and started my professional life as an entrepreneur, meaning that just after the university, I launched a first business with a, a friend from my school. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Thomas, I think on this first business, I, I made all the mistakes that a young engineer can do in, uh, in building, in building its, its company. And, you know, the biggest one is always the same. You enjoy developing a very good technical solution and you found out that it's not solving actually any actual problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this first company, we, we iterated over three different business models or pivoted on three different business models. And in the end, it ended super well. Our company got acquired by uh, one of the biggest French media company called Solocal. Um, um, and so, so it was quite of a, a super high of entrepreneurial journey. I didn't stay much mm -hmm. at Solocon, came back into the startup roads where I joined a peer-to-peer -peer current all marketplace called Drivey, been, which has been mm -hmm. acquired by Get Around, and left actually this company to create a new one, which is Spendesk. So basically, you know, my whole professional life mm -hmm. has been either into uh, building businesses or helping growing uh, uh, startups. Mm -hmm. And how did you come up with the idea for Spendesk? Was it uh, from a, a, an own pain point that you discovered yourself? Yeah, it really came uh, at the very beginning from two kind of enlightening experience that I had. Uh, the first one when, was my first company was acquired by this much bigger one. Uh, I took kind of the, you know, um, so we were a very small company, like 10, you know, 10 employees, very technical type of business. And we were acquired by this company of like 20,000 people. And mm -hmm. I took the kind of bureaucratic shock, you know, of corporate environment at that time. Uh, and honestly, at that time, I didn't figure out that there was a, a problem with how people pay at work. Uh, uh, um, uh, but I remember really having, you know, very strange uh, Kafkaist kind of moments where uh, uh, we were with uh, everyone in this organization trying to find workaround uh, to 
purchase stuff uh, outside of the finance process, which was very, very restrictive. Mm -hmm. I thought it was corporate world. Uh, uh, so that's why I left and moved back into more uh, early stage companies. And then I joined Drivey and I was leading operations there and had finance, the finance team in my scope. Uh, and when we started to grow at Drivey, so, uh, you know, in this, in this company, something I really love is this what we had this kind of, you know, ways of working, which was really basically based on trust and freedom. So every, everyone in the organization are really empowered to make their choice um, uh, for the business. And when mm -hmm. it was related to payment, uh, so one of the fun facts that we had when the company was super small is everyone had the car number of the CEO. So when they needed to make some purchase online, they could do it without being blocked, without any approval process, blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. then we started to grow. And obviously, we started to have symptoms of issues uh, about just controlling the company money, you know, who's spending what in the organization, how can we plan, how we can budget, and also starting to get some operational issues, meaning, you know, uh, traceability of payments, gathering receipt, getting invoice, etc. And so basically, we are just losing uh, the control of the company money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like every finance leader starts to do when you are growing and you need to structure your financial process. I did exactly the same because we are losing control. I started to centralize everything and building process in place where actually everything was coming from finance and employees had to go to finance to get a card to pay or some invoice to pay, etc. So us on finance, we get all the control. And, and basically at that time, I was like, but Rod, you believe in you know, these ways of working where you can move fast, when, where, where, where really people can make decisions on the business. On the other hand, you start putting in place, you know, kind of the processes you hated when you were in this bigger company. So why, why that is happening? And that's where the idea came in saying, or spenders came in saying, well, what, why can't we have this payment experience at work, which is very similar to you know, what we experience when we spend our own money while providing this level of control, this level of automation, this level of traceability of payments that finance needs to get that job done. And mm -hmm. I, in the end, I it started to be clear that we could not do that just because we are just actually missing the right tool, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the right tool that would enable finance to get that job done. Uh, uh, without having to centralize all this process of purchasing in the finance organization. And that's, that's where the opportunity of spenders came, came very clear. And I, uh, you know, I, I was like, okay, maybe we can help this organization being more, more free and empower their people just by mm -hmm. building this new norm, this new standard on how people should pay at work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And well, today Spendesk is a super successful, uh, fast growing company. Um, but founding companies and founding startups is hard. So I assume you also had some challenges in the beginning. Uh, what were so, what were uh, one or two of the um, biggest challenges you had in the first uh, three years of uh, starting Spendesk? And how did you overcome those challenges? That's a good question. And obviously, entrepreneurship is kind of a, you know, kind of a roller coaster with their ups and their downs. And you're solving new problems every day, new challenges every day. But going back to what could have been the, the biggest challenge, I think one we had in the early day of Spendesk was, you know, basically spend management at that time was not was not a thing, meaning that it's not it was not something people were looking for. Spend management as a word, as a category, even didn't exist for the SMB mid market. We we really were these pioneers where we were, you know, saying, hey, you can provide employees with payment methods so they can purchase uh, in their job uh, without losing control. And I remember, mm -hmm. so creating demand. Uh, uh, in these early days was actually one of the biggest challenge because, you know, everyone has the problem. Everyone knows that payment at work is a problem. The experience sucks, but no one knows that there is a new solution out there, right? 
So you've got solution for expense management, you've got solution for invoice management, but this idea on I'm going to give payment method to people so they can pay for the organization when they need to, uh, well, you know, this idea of decentralized spending in the organization, decentralized purchasing in the organization was really new. And so, you know, basically, how, how do you create demand? How do you uh, uh, have people coming to you saying, hey, I want to test your product. This sounds very good. And, 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 and we overcame this challenge asking ourselves, well, normally, you know, when you're doing an SMB SaaS type of business, inbound, uh, type, you know, inbound type of acquisition channel should be the go-to uh, first channel that you develop. But for us, again, impossible to create demand. So we started by an outbound acquisition model, which was very surprising for uh, people at that time, uh, which is basically, you know, contacting finance team and just asking them how the process was working in the organization and what were the key pay points. And, you know, not surprisingly, people telling us, ah, you know, yeah, it sucks, but this is how it is. And telling them, hey, we've got a new solution here. Do you want to test out? And surprisingly, the conversion rate that we had on the interest of people were actually very, very good and started helping us to, to, to build this first growth channel that was working super well for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good strategy to let the customers test the product. And that basically brings me to my next question. Uh, what kind of strengths or key fe features uh, are di differentiating Spendesk from um, competing solutions out there? Like, where do you see the unique advantages of Spendesk? I guess, I guess really... The, the value of Spendesk for organization is, is uh, the, the main benefits is, is basically giving finance team the tool so people in the organization can be really empowered. So Spendesk is the one-stop shop where, you know, when employees need to, need to pay with the company money, they've got just one solution, whatever their use case, wherever they are. Uh, 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 with whatever kind of payment method they need to pay with. So if mm -hmm. they need to pay online, they go to Spendesk. If they need to pay uh, an invoice, they go to Spendesk. If they are traveling and need to pay uh, kind of expenses, they get to Spendesk. And I guess most of the market traditionally, or most competitors have been more focused on payment methods. So for example, providing cards uh, to people, uh, so specific payment methods, or uh, specific use case, you know, expense management, and then you've got a different solution for uh, 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 purchasing process, and you've got a different solution for approval flows, etc. I guess the, the the unique advantage of Spendesk, and this is a 10x value for our customers, is that how you spend is centralized into one platform with an outstanding experience for the end users and the full control and automation for finance team, meaning that it's really enable uh, organization to move way faster and kill, you know, all this outdated bureaucratic process uh, 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 of managing company expense. And for the financing, you've got everything coming into one single place, following a real-time view of uh, people budget. So uh, every people in the organization can have actually the right context to make the decision when they need to spend the company money. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, and well, based on this product market fit, Spendesk has been growing uh, quite fast over the last years. Um, and also the team has been growing a lot. Um, and I was, I'm wondering, like, how do you foster a culture of innovation and creativity within your team? And how do you keep a fast growing team motivated and up to date? That's a good question. I think one of the core beliefs that we've got in Spendesk is, you know, in working culture, which are based on two principles. Uh, one is trust, second one is freedom. By trust is, I mean, working culture where really people are empowered to make decisions, obviously on their scope for their job, but also for the organization. And by freedom, I mean, you know, working culture that really continuously try to remove constraints that prevent people to just do their best work, right? Uh, and, and I guess this is one of our key for us to, to, to foster this culture of innovation is what we call decentralized ownership is, you know, we set a direction of, uh, for the organization, we set the what, but we 
give the full freedom for people. We empower them to set all the how and how they're going to solve the different problems they need to solve. So that's mm -hmm. what one of the big, uh, big end that we're having. The second one is, you know, a mindset, a culture of test and learning, kind of a scientific approach. You know, I'm an engineer. So, you know, mm -hmm. when you do science, uh, there is what you know and there is what you don't know. Uh, and it's all about trying to understand what you don't know, right? And, and in understanding what you don't know, you make assumptions, you run experiments, you look at the results, and then you iterate. And having this approach in everything that we do, uh, in terms of test and learn type of culture, continuous improvement, uh, bring this continuous innovation, continuous in improvement into the organization. So I think that's the two key elements for him, for, for me for uh, fostering this culture of innovation. In mm -hmm. terms of engagement, I guess, you know, that's why I'm, uh, I'm so huge a believer of liberated organization is because people can directly see the impact of their work, the impact of what they are doing, uh, naturally, uh, you've got an organization where people are highly engaged because they are passionate about what they do. And mm -hmm. I guess this is also one of uh, the consequences since you keep, uh, 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 despite the growth, despite the growing pain, despite the challenge that you have during a startup life, a very strong commitment, engagement, passion from your team in solving the problem we're solving for the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, today Spendesk is headquartered in Paris still, but uh, you guys are active in many international markets. Um, and what factors do you attribute to Spendesk's international success? And what strategies did you apply to enter and succeed in international markets? So... First thing, I think we've been international from day one in terms of mindset. Uh, since kind of, you know, sometimes ridiculous when you, uh, for, for, for companies that are in English, but, but, that, that are from England, but for a French company, the native language is French. Uh, but at Spendes, for example, since day one, even when I was just a bunch of French people, English was the company language. Uh, and it helped us very early on to, hire, integrate, onboard international talent in the organization, which brings a diverse perspective and also a better understanding of the different markets we can go in. I think this is principle number one. And the second thing is very early on in the startup stage, we went international. And normally this is not something that is recommended in Europe, which is more, hey, you should you know, build your own market. And when you've got your own market, Your, your own market, you, you can expand internationally. That was not our strategy because our product is so innovative that we had to really understand is the problem we were to solve was, you know, how much local specificities would happen in different countries. Ah, uh, I don't know, people in the UK spending in the same way that in France is, you know, the... Uh, finance tool stack uh, different, what's the different regulatory uh, um, in terms of accounting, tax, et cetera, that we need to take into account. Uh, mm -hmm. What about Germany, you know? And, and, and so very early on, we decided to test our product in multiple markets to really better understand from a product perspective, you know, what, what has to be localized. And by localized, I don't mean just translation of your product, but it's really what are the product capabilities that need to be adapted to specific market and what is actually global uh, in terms of problem we're solving. And because mm -hmm. we did that, we started to bring native uh, people in Paris because this is where we had our, our first office. But very, very on, I'm telling you about employee number 15 uh, to employee number 20, where uh, people were started to focus in different markets which help us grow, help us grow uh, um, several markets at the same time uh, in this early product market market stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's talk a bit about the future. Um, what is your vision for Spendesk for the coming years? And where do you see the company in like five years from now in terms of size and impact? And that's a good question. You know, our ambition is really to become the, the new standard on how people pay at work. We want to become this reference, right? We want to, mm -hmm. we know that every company between, you know, and uh, the core target that we're addressing, so businesses between 50 to 2,000 employees will equip themselves in the future with a solution that we spend as, right? Because this is how people will work in the future. So we are really at the beginning of, 
the opportunity we're after. We're just kind of scratching the surface of the iceberg. If you think about, you know, in Europe, you've got roughly 1 million of these uh, uh, SMB mid market businesses, uh, mm -hmm. which are transforming their ways of working and will adopt Spendesk in the future. So we, we truly believe that we can take an important share of the B2B payments by really becoming this operating system on how people pay at work. And that's, that's, that's clearly our ambition. And if I fast forward five years from now, I guess, uh, you know, uh, we will be this reference in Europe. We will start thinking on how we can expand more globally outside of Europe. And by five years, I would, I would like for us to be a public company by then. Okay, exciting. And uh, well, a while ago, Spendes uh, also reached unicorn status and you were able to raise a lot of venture capital for the company. We have uh, many um, aspiring founders, young entrepreneurs listening to this podcast. And I was wondering, can you share some um, basic tips um, for early stage founders on what to do and what not to do when it comes to fundraising? You know, in the end, it's not about fundraising for fundraising, right? It's If you've got... Uh, a product that solves uh, a big problem uh, for many people and people love your product, you will find fundraising, uh, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's, that's the key focus. Maybe that's, that's my number one advice for uh, founders at the early stage is really focus on the problem you need to solve, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, focus on building this great product and making sure that people love your product. And as soon as you start having this product usage, this strong traction, you know, fundraising will come naturally. Uh, I've seen sometimes uh, founders in the early stage more focusing on fundraising for fundraising by itself. Uh, uh, like, you know, the amount of capital they raise being the indicator of success of their company. This is very wrong. This is, most mm -hmm. of the time, it's not something that works, right? So in terms of, What you mm -hmm. should not do is defocusing yourself of the understanding of your customer, the understanding of what market are you addressing, the understanding of building the right product to address this market and you know the screaming needs uh, uh, of the users in this market. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and that's where 100% of your time and bandwidth should be allocated in the early, early days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, last question um, for today's interview. I think we also have a few listeners who might be interested in joining the um, Spendex uh, journey and joining your team. Uh, in which areas are you planning to hire in the next few months and, and years? Like which areas are um, growing most rapidly and where is the best way for um, uh, future team members to uh, to apply? That's a great question. So we, 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 we continue to hire. We mostly hiring in engineering, uh, mm -hmm. position in a product position, uh, so to continue to build and invest, uh, into becoming this new standard of payment at work. We also have open position in sales, in customer success, in marketing. So every kind of department continue to, uh, hire at the moment. Uh, so if you want to join, uh, we've got position either in Paris, in Berlin, uh, in London, uh, or fully remote in Europe, um, and you can directly apply on our website. This is the best way to, to reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rod, for your time. Um, congratulations on your success so far, and EU startups will definitely continue to report on the um, Spendesk journey. And yeah, thank you so much for being part of the EU Startups podcast. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks.